Hello, and welcome to the Think JSAL webinar series, brought to you by the Office for Strategic Engagements at the Joint Special Operations University. Today, we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAL network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the United States government, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Special Operations Command, and the Joint Special Operations University. If you have questions after the session, please email thinkjsal at jsal.edu. Good afternoon. Welcome to another Think JSAL interview. I'm Mike Parrott, a course director at the Joint Special Operations University. Today's guest is James Lawler, a national security consultant and veteran of the CIA. James served as a member of the CIA Senior Intelligence Services for 25 years as an operations officer in various international posts and as the chief of the Counterproliferation Division's Special Activities Unit. Jim mastered the art of recruiting foreign spies and spent over half his career building and battling uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. He led the team responsible for taking down the AQ Khan Nuclear Proliferation Network, and in 2005, James retired from the agency. However, he still contributes to our nation's security as a consultant and senior partner at the MDO Group, which provides human training to the IC and the commercial sector. Jim, thank you for your service to our nation. Welcome to today's Think JSAL. I'm looking forward to our discussions concerning your new book and your insights on the topics of spycraft and espionage. Mr. Lawler, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mike, for that very gracious introduction. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. Today, I'd like to discuss three specific areas uh, based on your experience and publications. First, we'll discuss your new book, In the Twinkling of an Eye, a novel of biological terror and espionage. This kind of hits home for me because of my previous background within the CWMB field and now in the counterintel field. Uh, next, we'll talk about the extensive career in the agency focusing on spycraft and espionage. And then we'll conclude with the discussion on current events and the threats the PRC poses in this arena. Uh, so we'll get started. Can you provide a short description of the book and what was the premise for writing it and what gave you kind of the, the idea to, to go into authoring these novels? Well, Mike, it started, my first book was about the Iranian nuclear weapons program and I devoted a substantial part of my career uh, countering all kinds of weapons of mass destruction. And nuclear is certainly a very scary thing. But there's a choke point in nuclear, and there's which is called fissile material. If you don't have the fissile material, the guts of a nuclear weapon, you don't have a weapon. No such choke point exists with biological weapons. The knowledge is pretty much ubiquitous. Every country, if they wanted to have a biological weapons program, could have one. And the material is not that difficult to obtain. Um, I, you know, granted, more sophisticated biological weapons would need the uh, resources of a nation state. And I've always you know, wondered about, and I think the intelligence community has wondered about, the uh, Russian biological weapons program. <clears throat> we were absolutely unaware of how extensive, massive, the Russian biological weapons program was until we got some uh, defectors who told us how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the former Soviet Union were involved in developing very sophisticated biological weapons. And even though they claim to have given it up, we still have strong suspicions that there could be either lingering or more than lingering efforts at very devastating biological weapons being developed in Russia. And so I put together this, this book called In the Twinkling of an Eye, based on a young Ukrainian boy whose father dies at Chernobyl. He's the head of the fire squad that goes to put that uh, massive nuclear conflagration out in 1986 and dies, as did a number of the uh, Russian or Soviet at the time, Soviet firemen in this horrible nuclear accident. Well, the young man, he's only about 13 at the time. When that happens, he, his eyes are irradiated and he develops cataracts. And in removing those cataracts, his, one of his eyes is infected 
and he has to have the eyeball literally removed and he's re it's replaced with an artificial eye and this is again when he's a teenager and we can all recall when we were teenagers how self-conscious we were at our appearance so his dad has died as a hero of the soviet union the uh, state basically uh, does try to make it up to him by sending him to Moscow State University where he excels in genetics, etc. And then he learns the ugly truth that his father and these other firemen did not have to die. It was a massively uh, missile, miscalculated accident because of, of some deliberate uh, missteps that were taken. And he feels absolutely betrayed that his dad had to die in this horrible accident and then he had lost his eye. At the same time, he has passed along, unfortunately, some uh, genetic abnormalities to his young daughter, who's now about 12 or 13. And she's developed a type of leukemia, which is due to his messed up genes that he passed along to her. And so we have this plot brewing where we have a very disgruntled Russian scientist he had been seduced and, you know, and attracted into a covert program, which the Russian intelligence service is running in a facility that they call Lab X. And in reality, we actually have heard of a Lab X that the uh, Russian internal service, the FSB, has. Uh, I'm not saying that this Lab X is the same thing, but I thought I'd give it the same name as the one that we suspect that does all the dirty tricks and the assassination tools. And the Russians, not surprisingly, team up with the North Koreans. And you might say, well, what do the North Koreans have to offer? They have live test subjects that they can, that they can offer to the Russians. Now, developing in parallel with this story is one that goes on over in Korea, where a young Korean girl born in North Korea to a North Korean military officer uh, loses her mother. And the fact that she loses her mother is due to the fact that the um, North Koreans deny her mom any, mel any medical uh, assistance in curing the disease she has because her mother was the child of a Christian missionary. And so even though her father is a fairly senior uh, North Korean military officer, they deny the uh, woman the ability to, uh, to recover from this disease. That infuriates her father and he happens to be the uh, North Korean officer who's in charge of tunneling under the demilitarized zone in North Korea. You may be aware that there are a lot of these tunnels that we know about or suspect that are under the de demilitarized zone so that if there was an invasion by North Korea, South Korea, they could infiltrate troops in. Well, he takes his daughter and her younger brother into this tunnel and they escape, but just barely. In fact, they're, they're confronted. And the only the girl and the boy make it out and she makes it across the DMZ and is found by a U.S. military officer who adopts her and brings her to the United States. She becomes a an FBI special agent and she wants to devote her life to basically countering the North Koreans and their focus on weapons of mass destruction. So you have these two lives in parallel, a North Korean girl who's now a U.S. Um, FBI agent, and then this man in Moscow who's feeling very betrayed and that the, his government has lied to him all these years about his father's death. And, and indeed, it was a heroic death, but it was an unnecessary death. And in my own career, the, one of the primary reasons and methods I was able to use to recruit people was when they felt betrayed, because that's how they can rationalize the fact that, no, I'm not the one who's the traitor. You betrayed me first. And that's that's the theme, basically, of this man over there. The FBI special agent, she actually recruits him. And then I took the, uh, the thing about his eye, and I uh, postulated that in a few years, we would have some advanced artificial intelligence and microelectronics that would allow that eye to actually function as an eye and record both audio and video so that it would become the perfect spy tool. And all he has to do is to look at things. He doesn't have to use a camera. He doesn't have to copy anything. He just has to scan stuff with his eye and it records that 
And then the way they transmit it is that he takes the eye out and puts it in the hands of a uh, doll. Uh, in fact, his, one of his little girl's dolls who has been equipped with artificial intelligence as well. And she transmits, she, the doll, transmits that information back to the United States so that his handler, his FBI recruiter, will know what's going on. And the doll is almost sentient. She's got a, a wicked sense of humor, and she's able to talk to the man either through from the FBI agent herself or the doll can actually talk based, based on his own AI. And at the time I wrote this about two or three years ago, we had not heard about chat GT. We had not heard a lot about artificial intelligence, but I speculated that at some point we could have something like this. And so that's where the tension begins. And the man that Russian scientists are recruited, and he finds out that the Russians and the North Koreans have developed a very, very devastating genetic bioweapon which they can use for either assassination, if they have your genetic makeup, your DNA makeup, or they can use it for genocide by generalizing it. And you may be aware, but we have great fears that the Chinese may be working on something just like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, they would like to get rid of those pesky Uyghurs. They would like to get rid of anybody who's not a Han Chinese. And you can design a biological weapon to where it targets certain ethnic groups because they have certain genetic uh, characteristics that are frequently unique to them. So it literally, it would be a genocidal weapon. Yeah, I, I literally just saw something in the, that was published about the Chinese fearing that. It, it's kind of an oxymoron because they're the ones developing it, yet they're sitting there saying that they're afraid that it's going to get used against them. Um, and then I, I was looking at your some of the book reviews for uh, this novel, and... The Cypher Brief did a, a phenomenal job uh, reviewing it, talking about CRISPR-Cas9, the gene editing technology, and how it, it's really sparked uh, a lively debate uh, on the government side of whether or not that technology needs to be restricted or limited based off of the potential for not only nation states to use it, but also violent extremist organizations to use it. Mike, it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that article about the Chinese, because just like you, I thought, how ironic is that? Because the one country that is probably developing something like that is saying, well, terrorists might use this. I, I think the Chinese might, might, in fact, use it. A good friend of mine who is an FBI special agent, uh, Ed Yu is his name. He's a supervisory special agent, and he is a specialist on the fact he goes around warning us about all of the things the Chinese are doing, including buying up a lot of these genetic tracing companies, you know, for their ancestry dot com, et cetera. Uh, the 23 and me's those type of companies and that the Chinese are amassing all this genetic data on the American population and everybody else in the world. And that actually plays a, a point, a part in my book where a senior counterintelligence officer at CIA wanting to know more about his Scottish ancestry has sent his DNA into one of these companies. And so, you know, it sounds like fiction, except it's real that they are buying these things and they've got my, my DNA, they may have your DNA. And once they've got people's DNA, they know what the weaknesses are and how to, um, how to affect them. It could be either for an assassination. It could be for genocide. Or it could be in a recruitment attempt. If I know you have a rare blood type or if you some, something like that, or that your child is sick, I've, I've recruited several people who had sick children and they would only find medical assistance in the United States. That is a very, very handy recruitment tool for somebody to have. Well, uh, I know we had talked previously in preparation for this, uh, our conversation regarding your WMD background and uh, the focus on uh, that network and how that played a cr critical role in how you were able to recruit those individuals. But let me go back to something you also said about useful fictions and how they play out. I mean, exactly what's going on now on the the AI piece, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and these genetic weapons. It is out there in the open. It is being uh 
discussed. It is, you think it's sci-fi, but in, in all actuality, it's reality. And so Ed Yu, uh, he's come and talked uh, here at JSL on a number of uh, occasions. And like you said, he, he's highlighting this out to not only the government side, but also the commercial side to let them know, hey, you're you're at a vulnerability as well. You're you're threatened by uh, these nation states that are leveraging your technology that you're developing, and then turning against you, and then stealing it that proprietary information, and building their own companies just to uh, maintain that market control. Uh, I know China is looking at being the number one producer of uh, in the bioeconomy and looking at uh, all these medical solutions and being able to capitalize on that and make it where you have to come to them in order to gain any type of uh, medical treatment or to find the the right mechanism to fix your ailment. So, and that goes also on the technology side. So let's let's transition to your background, breaking up the nuclear uh, proliferation network that AQCon had, how you went about uh, dismantling that, and then that'll tie right into the spycraft and espionage piece of your background and experience as a master recruiter. When I was on my uh, last tour overseas, I recruited a very remarkable uh, man who was able to give us incredible insights into the uh, Iranian nuclear weapons program. And I've always been fascinated, indeed horrified, at the effects of a nuclear weapon. When I was only 14 years old, I read John Hersey's book, Hiroshima. And in that book, they describe the uh, fact that uh, in one location, Hiroshima, there are three shadows cast on a wall and the people that cast those shadows were either vaporized or dead. And the only thing that's really a testament to their lives are these shadows where the uh, shockwave, the blast wave, basically that brilliant flash, they shielded the concrete behind them just for a, for a few seconds, perhaps. And that's what cast the shadows on the wall. And here I was 14 years old. And I just thought, now, just imagine here you are, and then you're not there anymore. And the only testament to your life are those horrible, those shadows, eerie shadows cast on a wall. So when I recruited this gentleman, he uh, knew that I was very interested in stopping weapons of mass destruction programs. And he told me, he said, Jim, if you want to stop a WMD program, you have to look for the choke points. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, he said, you've got to look to see the types of technology that they really have to have and what they can't get easily. And so we looked at the Iranian program. And let's take, for example, a uranium enrichment plant. Okay, it turns out, according to our experts, that there are really maybe 12, 15 technologies that you really have to have in a uranium enrichment plant I mean, you've got to have it or you don't have the plant. And secondly, that the customer, the Iranians, cannot manufacture domestically. And perhaps they're under trade sanctions, as they are now, and they can't import it. So he says, focus on those. And that's the thing that will help you defeat a WMD program. So we were looking to do that in the Middle East. And Iran, of course, was not the only target because we have a lot of wannabe nations over there. and the thing that uh, struck me of the methodology was a lesson I learned in a counterintelligence class that was conducted by a senior FBI retired special agent named Dave Major. And Dave Majors, he, he taught us in the class a lot of the classic operations in history. And one of the best examples of a classic intelligence operation was one that was uh, devised back in 1917 by Felix Szerzynski. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that name, he was the guy who was the Bolshevik uh, originator of the Soviet secret police, the Cheka. And Lenin specifically recruited him 
to counter the efforts by the United States and Great Britain to overthrow the Bolshevik Revolution. So he was looking for counter revolutionaries. And it came to him one day that in order to defeat counter revolutionaries, he would have to become a counter revolutionary, meaning that his Czechist agents, these Soviet secret police agents, fanned out across Russia, pretending to be counter revolutionaries. And in doing so, they located all of the safe houses, all of the secret agents, all of the uh, funding mechanisms. It was so effective, they even controlled the bank in Paris, through which all the money was going to the counter-revolutionary groups. And then he systematically rounded these people up and shot them. And so by pretending to be a counter-revolutionary, he was able to defeat them. And so I thought, if I want to defeat proliferators, I have to also become a proliferator and set out entities abroad that would hold themselves out to be prolif sources of proliferant technology and especially of choke point technology. So we did that out in somewhere out in the Middle East. And um, lo and behold, after a while, <clears throat> we came into touch with people that were very interesting to us. And these were the elements of the AQ Khan network. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. A.Q. Khan, he was a Pakistani scientist, a metallurgist, who had been educated in the Netherlands. And long about the mid-70s, he saw, with, as did the Pakistani government, that India had developed a, an atomic weapon. And Dr. Khan, despite what I may think of him, <laughs> was a Pakistani patriot. And so he offered the Pakistani government uh, all of this very specialized technology that his company in Europe, which was called Urenco, uh, which is a consortium of the Dutch, the British, and the Germans, it's a company that specializes in uh, running centrifuge enrichment plants, basically the plants that take uh, basic natural uranium, which is only seven-tenths of a percent of uranium-235 isotope, and that's the fissile isotope you need. And through a process of um, turning it into a gas, uranium hexafluoride, they run this through these ultra centrifuge cascades and gradually increase the enrichment until it reaches what we would commonly call weapons grade. And that means it could be somewhere north of 80%, 85%, like uh, our little boy weapon was approximately that much. And it's, it's a gradual process of taking the, the uranium hexafluoride and running it back and back through those cascades and then and gradually enriching the mixture to where it reaches the highly enriched uranium that you need for a weapon. So he stole those plans, took it back to Pakistan. And the genius of this man was that he didn't have Pakistanis in Europe as his procurement agents. He was a consummate networker and he recruited a lot of Europeans, Dutch, Germans, Swiss, you name it. And he had them act as his procurement agents and design experts. And so he had this technology that he took back to Pakistan and was able to start what was called Khan Research Laboratory in Kahuta, Pakistan. And they produced the fissile material for Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Well, we saw elements of this, of this his activity in the Middle East, and we were able to basically by having a entities out there that were very attractive to people in this network, we were able to get close to these people and ultimately learn everything that they were doing. And um, ultimately we pinpointed the fact that this was going on. Nobody knew about this. A lot of people were wondering about, was it officially Pakistani uh, proliferation? No, it wasn't. It was purely Dr. Khan himself. And he was doing this as a private individual. He controlled Khan Research Laboratory. And this was the first time the intelligence community had ever seen a, a sole super empowered individual take proliferation private. And we were able to penetrate the network and fortunately, ultimately take them down. This, however, took almost nine years by from the start to finish. It took a long time, but as one of my best CIA assets once told me, he said, Jim, good cooking takes time. 
and a good intelligence operation does as well. So I, we, we did this, we took it down, we discovered that uh, Libya at the time, they were the customer of these weapons. And we were in the midst of negotiations with the Libyan government because Muammar Gaddafi, Colonel Gaddafi had seen what was going on in Iraq and he came to a uh, one of his few lucid decisions uh, that it was better to be a friend of the United States than an enemy. And so his um, negotiators were meeting with our negotiators in secret. And we our demand was that they have to give up their WMD programs. He said, fine, that's what we're going to do. However, they stonewalled us on the nuclear part of the equation and claimed that they only had a peaceful nuclear reactor at Tujura in Libya. Well, we knew otherwise because of our penetration of the network, and we were able to stop a large shipment of five 40-foot containers filled with hundreds of thousands of nuclear components in Italy. And when our negotiators next met with the Libyans, the uh, we once again asked about their nuclear program. They stonewalled and then one of our chief negotiators said, what about then the five 40-foot containers we took off of this book, boat, the BBC China, which is now in Tripoli Harbor? <laughs> they called a quick recess and then came back a few hours later and said, praise Allah, but you're right. We do have a nuclear program. And so they came clean, and we quickly got all of that equipment out of there. But this was the largest interdiction of nuclear equipment in history. And they had everything. They had, you know, the uranium enrichment technology. They had the, um, the plans for a weapon. Um, it was things that Dr. Khan had basically sold to them on his own. This was not a Pakistan to Libya prolifer proliferation program. This was a Dr. Khan proliferation program. And so I'm very proud to say that our team was able to get in, uh, basically develop all the intelligence for this, and then disrupt it and bring it down. You highlight a number of uh, key points there. I want to uh, make sure that I capture. First, human and CI work takes time. It's not something that you can develop when a crisis erupts. And ultimately, if you're wanting to be in a proactive posture, you need to start thinking about it. Leaders, policymakers, and they need to get that out there get those source networks developed, continually refined, vetted, so that way when that balloon goes up or when that crisis situation happens, we're able to actually leverage those networks that are in place over time versus trying to create one after the fact, like what happened in Afghanistan after 9-11. We just didn't have the networks to activate as quickly as we wanted to, and it took a substantial amount of time to build that up. So as we look at the the recruitment side of the house and how you, you're you able to get these individuals to ultimately commit espionage or to uh, work on the, the USG side, uh, a lot of times you hear the, the acronym MICE thrown around, uh, money, ideology, coercion, and ego. Uh, but you, you highlighted in your previous example of uh, betrayal and that becoming a motivation. Are there some other ones that kind of fit in there uh, that don't fit that MICE uh, acronym well? Well, for one thing, let me start by saying that I believe that money, the, the M in MICE, is rarely, if ever, a motivation. People do it for money, but they that's because they have an underlying reason. They may, at my first substantial recruitment, I'll quickly go through that, was a, uh, a fellow that I had pitched. I pitched this gentleman because he had access to some special intelligence uh, for some very substantial negotiations that the United States was going to go into about a year from then. And I was a first tour officer. I was very naive. And I thought because I had a solid friendship with this man, that somehow I could convince him to betray his government and work for us for a certain amount of money. Well, that was incredibly naive. Just having a friendship doesn't mean you can recruit somebody. So I pitched the guy and he said, Jim, you know, you and I are friends, but what you're proposing is morally wrong. 
And that's the only man, by the way, out of the 50 or 60 people I've pitched to commit espionage who's ever posed a moral objection. So I backed off thinking, well, this isn't this isn't good because at CIA, we have a saying that it's okay to get turned down, but not turned in. Meaning if he goes to his ambassador and complains that he was propositioned by me to become a traitor, I could just envision that ambassador going and lodging a very strongly worded protest with our ambassador. And even though I had CIA headquarters permission to do this, like any organization, I could see people back home backpedaling away from this, wondering how I had screwed this up. You know, here they had given permission for me to do it. And even though it was a very ill-conceived proposal, because I had seen absolutely no vulnerabilities in this man, and just thought I could recruit him on the power of my personality and our friendship, which is naive. It's not going to work. And it didn't work. Well, I, I agonized about this for a few days, thinking my career was probably over because this ambassador was going to go ballistic. And finally worked up the courage to phone him and ask him if, if um, maybe if we could go out again. And I was relieved when he didn't hang up in my ear. And I said, boy, we had such a good time at dinner last week. How about if we do that again this coming week? And I was very relieved when he said, Jim, I was thinking the same thing. Let's do that. So I thought, good. Now, my only object at this next meeting is to basically smooth the waters out, to maybe apologize and say, I think my words were taken out of context. I was hasty to do something. I wanted to, you know, smooth out any ruffled feathers. I get to that second dinner. Now, this is one week later, and the waiter dropped the menus off, walked away from the table, and my friend's first words were, Jim, that offer you made me last week, is that still good? And I said, sure, we're friends. And he says, well, what you don't know is my wife announced that she wants a divorce about two days after that dinner, and I can't afford to pay her the alimony to which she's entitled and put my two high school age boys in private schools next year when I go home. Because in my country, if you don't get a good private education, you don't get a good education. I can't do that unless I accept your offer, even though I know it's morally wrong. So he needed money, yes, but he needed money because of the fact his wife was divorcing him, the fact he needed the money for his children, but it's never just money for money's sake. And yeah. But then I found out that there's usually more than one motivation when people do this. In fact, I call it a mosaic of motivations, because the first time he came out of his embassy with a stack of classified documents, and literally it was about three or four inches thick, as he was handing me these, he said, I want you to know why I'm doing this. It's because I hate my ambassador. That son of a bitch steals the credit for everything that I do and everybody else does in my embassy. And he goes around this country like a little banny rooster, you know, bragging about all these great things he does. So when I hand you this material, Jim, it's like I'm kicking that son of a bitch in the face. I took the stuff from him and I said, you and I are a team now. Get me some more of this and let's kick that son of a bitch again. <laughs> and he was he. But it was revenge. It was. It was he was able to justify it, thinking that I'm about not betraying anything. They betrayed me first, so that's that's part of the ego part, I think, of the uh, of the equation that you just talked about, Mike. So I'm discounting money, but ideology, yeah, ideology. We had a lot of people that were suffering under communism, that uh, that uh, you know were not happy with it. They wanted to be part of a system like ours. Uh, I've recruited some WMD people who are very dis disappointed, very concerned about the direction in their country of the WMD program. Coercion, that's one we typically don't use, but I can guarantee you that the Russians and the Chinese use it. Uh, I don't like to do it, and it's not for a moral issue. It's because I don't want a rattlesnake in the backseat of my car. I want somebody positively motivated to commit espionage to be part of my team. And then finally, E, which is probably the biggest letter in the entire part of that equation, ego. And there's all kinds of reasons why people. And I, I put revenge in that because it's a damage to your ego when people react like that. So 
yes, I think all of those motivations, typically there's not just one. Uh, and, you know, you have to get to the underlying, you know, what what is the underlying motivation for this? No, I definitely agree with you. I mean, we see in the news recently with the Navy sailors out there in California that they're saying, oh, it's all uh, it was all about money. I I I think there's something else there. They just haven't peeled back the onion far enough to figure out, OK, was it just money or was it ideology? Was it? some other uh, motivating factor on why uh, what like you said revenge was that something that they wanted to get back at uh, their employer or uh, their supervisor and they just wanted to show hey i can do this we we sit there and we we always look at the negative as far as okay why this individual did it but we don't really talk about the case officer and how or that uh that master recruiter that's going to go out and pitch the individuals what are some good lessons or good pieces of advice if for these new generational uh, intelligence professionals when it comes to recruiting an individual uh, to ultimately commit sabotage subversion sedition or uh, exploit their placement access i've got 10 elements that i think are essential to being a, um, a good recruiter. In your previous discussions with the CISO insider threat interview that you did, you talked about empathy, patience, uh, resistance, keen listening ability, and curiosity, to name a few. Maybe you can elaborate on some of those. Well, empathy, empathy, I think is essential because if I want to, if I want to recruit somebody, I want to be able to get inside their head and find out where where are the stress points? I tell folks that I never once recruited a happy person. You don't recruit happy people. You recruit people under stress. And so having that empathy, being, you know, em, fairly empathic, what does it mean? How are you hurting? How can I relieve that stress? I used to be a rock climber when I was a young man. And the way you climb a rock or climb the, the mountain is you look for the crack system. And that's what I was always doing, was looking for the human crack system. And initially, from afar off, you can't do it. That's why recruiting takes time. Uh, it, you have to study the person, figure out what it is that is causing this person to be unhappy. In one specific case, it took me 11 years to recruit one asset. Now, was I constantly with that person for 11 years? No, I met him on a tour got to be friends with him. He was part of it. He was uh, from a country where we didn't have many solid recruitments and we needed him. But I saw really no vulnerabilities in those first two or three years of our relationship. But we were very close, genuinely liked the guy. Uh, we uh, became, uh, you know, we went to athletic events together. We used to go running together, did a lot of things. And be, he became like a member of my family. But I saw nothing that could cause me to really want to recruit him. Well, over time, though, he um, I moved away and he married a woman from this country. And he sent me an email or called me. I think he called me and he said, Jim, I'd like you to come and be my best man. That's how close I was to this guy at his wedding. And so I went there and at the rehearsal dinner, I I kind of hinted that I had special connections in Washington and that if he was ever in trouble or needed help to just let me know. So he went off to another assignment in a, I started to say a third world country, but this is really more of a fourth world country. And his new wife was very unhappy there, even though she'd had a child and she got very disenchanted and thought I didn't sign on for this. And so she moved away back to her home country. And so he's going through the psychological turmoil of a divorce, just like my friend, my first big recruitment did psychological, financial, emotional turmoil. Well, then he gets reassigned to his home country and he's found out that in the years that he's been gone, that his ethnic group has been replaced by another ethnic group entirely. And he wrote me and said, Jim, here I am back home in the capital of my country. I'm working almost seven days a week, 
12 to 15 hours a day, and there's no way I can ever be promoted again. How can I give allegiance to a country which treats its citizens like that? <laughs> Somewhere overseas where he was going to visit his uh, ex-wife and his daughter, and that maybe I could come up with some uh, things that would be helpful to him. And so that took me about 30 seconds to break cover, to thank him for, even if he suspected I was a CIA officer, to never really, um, you know, expose me or anything like that. And I said, I'd like you to join my team. And he said, you know, now I've got something to believe in. So he was, you know, he felt betrayed. I was, I was patient. I think that was one of the things I was talking about. Because it's my firm philosophy that everybody at some point, a real low point in their lives is potentially recruitable. And you just have to be alert to what those, those issues are. And I was very, you know, sympathetic with him. In fact, when he said, I want, you know, now I'm a member of your team. This was right before 9-11, a few months before. And when 9-11 happened, he was back home in his home country in his foreign ministry. And he said he saw those twin towers coming down and he became very emotional to the point where he was almost crying. And his colleagues saw that and they wondered, why are you so upset? You're not an American. And he said, it was almost like a counterintelligence issue I was having there because I was so emotional. But he said, what they didn't know is now I'm a member of your team. And that's how they, they, they transfer their allegiance to us. And that's what I want them to do. I want them to feel like they're part of the team, that they're part of my team. And I want them always to be positively motivated. So I don't use threats. I, I, I'm a, in fact, a couple of my assets have said, Jim, when you're talking to us or speaking to me, it's like my brain is in a warm water bed. Your voice is soothing. I know I can tell you anything and I know I can trust you because trust is the basic foundation of any human relationship. And I want them to feel that trust and I want to be able to feel it as well. So I think, you know, having a you know persuasive personality, that certainly helps. My voice modulation helps. The, um, the patience certainly helps. Uh, being a student of human frailty, knowing what, what hurts people and how can, I, how can I solve that for them. All of those qualities are what I consider to be essential to recruiting, genuinely caring for the person. And I know some of the people we recruit are not nice people. But I was able to usually find at least one redeeming thing about any person, and I'd focus on that. And sometimes these people have absolutely no friends at all, except for you. And so you become their cheerleader. You become their team captain. You always have to be the captain of the team. And you reward them with things. I had one uh, very senior scientist, foreign scientist I recruited, and I would praise him. And he was so hungry for that praise. It was almost, I'm sure all of you who've ever had a dog and you pet that dog and the tail's just wagging. It's the same thing with a human being. He was so desperate for some praise. And I thought to myself, though, I bet you his father never said I love you to him. He, he needed a like almost like a father figure to care for him and to give those basic, you know, those human needs and to meet that. The whole premise of being that person that's going to be there to listen, to to have that curiosity, to, to ask those those questions that get down to the root causes of what's causing that individual uh, grief or causing them uh, pain is critical in this uh, in this field because otherwise you're just hitting that top layer, you're just hitting that. Uh, being superficial and they're going to see right through it. They're going to realize that you don't have their back. You're, you can't be trusted to come get them in those times uh, that are going to get tough or to be there when, when they need to be uh, exfilled out of a, a sticky situation. I mean, when we look at what happened in Afghanistan with the withdrawal and uh, the efforts uh, Pineapple Express, doing what was right, what was necessary to safeguard those families and get those individuals out of uh, out of harm's way. 
that had put their life on the line for our country. That's what it means to to work in this uh, line of work. And a lot, oftentimes I, I get discouraged when I see policymakers sit uh, and bureaucrats sit putting their private interests or their personal interests over the top of what our nation stands for. I mean, we were built uh, a nation of laws. We were built uh, on biblical principles. And now that if you don't adhere to those, then that foundation becomes uh, the sand that gets washed away uh, when the storm comes. So um, as we as we look at current events, how do you see a shift from, say, the, the MICE methodology to and applying that towards the uh, the PRC's intelligence uh, activities and their espionage activities here uh, within the U.S. and abroad. Uh, I mean, they're doing a lot of commercial uh, economic espionage compared to what you would see uh, in traditional senses of trying to penetrate uh, the military or the intelligence uh, apparatus. One thing I learned from a friend of mine who was one of the best uh case officers ever to work against the China target was, he said, you never want to criticize China, the nation, China itself. You can criticize the people, you know, the uh, Chinese Communist Party. He says, because a lot of them do the same thing. But he said, you don't criticize China as the historical entity. But it's a lot of them bear a lot of resentment against the uh, excesses of the Chinese Communist Party. So if you can play on that, then that's that's what you need to do. But you're 100 percent correct, Mike. Right now we're faced with I like to say this is almost like the Korean War where the Chinese mounted human wave attacks against us. Uh, we've all seen those movies where that, you know, how do, they just are overwhelming. I have so much sympathy for our FBI colleagues who are trying to defend us domestically right now against efforts, multiple efforts on all fronts. Uh, they buy companies, they steal intellectual property, they uh, have got it going up. Their resources, I'm sure, exceed the number of FBI special agents we have. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible what they're doing. They are recruitable, though. Believe me, they are recruitable. When I served in one particularly large station overseas, uh, I was working an internal target, and there was another branch of the station called the Hard Targets Branch which used to upset me thinking, so what am I, chopped liver? Am I in soft targets? I don't think so. In fact, I don't think there are any such things as hard targets. There's only hard access. And people are people. And, you know, if you can engineer somehow either through serendipity or through very careful planning a way to meet a target and work that target over time, I don't care if they're Russians, they're North Koreans, they're Chinese, Iranians, whatever, you can recruit them. Believe me, you can recruit them. We've recruited all of them. And they always have the same human motivations, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those same emotional needs that every human being needs. In fact, I jokingly say, you know, where we're going to run into a problem is if we have to work against, say, AI or robots, you know, who have no needs like that. But then I jokingly add, well, we will just unplug them or take their batteries out because we but honestly, people are people. And, yeah, there's some cultural differences, sure. But they have those basic human needs that all of us have. And, yeah, it's the, the Chinese target is certainly one that I would focus on a lot, but not at the exclusion of the Russians or the Iranians or some other targets, too, who are, are equally um, dangerous. No, I, I completely agree, especially with what's going on in the Middle East right now. Uh, the fact that Iran's proxies are sitting there attacking Israel, but they're also attacking our bases in Iraq and Syria and other parts of the Middle East. And then you look at the homeland and the southern uh, southern border and how porous it, it is right now, the lack of uh, any type of prevention just uh, I just read a CBP publication on their website talking about 
over 564 known or suspected terrorists have been encountered or uh, detained uh, coming through the Southern approach just this year. So if that's 563 that they caught, when we're looking at millions uh, coming across the Southern border just this year, how many got through? How many do we not know about? I was listening to a audio book about the covert Iran, US and Israeli war that's been going on for decades and how a number of those individuals were working here within the US as professors and then went back and are now leaders within Hamas and Hezbollah. And it it, it just is eye opening to the fact that we are penetrated uh, from within. The homeland is not as secure as we we want it to be. And we need to be vigilant as we look uh, to the upcoming future with the potential for not only those nation states, uh, intelligence apparatus exploiting us, but also uh, homegrown and violent extremist activities here in the U.S. Um, as we look to close this up, I wanted to discuss those lessons learned from your perspective. As a veteran intelligence professional, uh, what advice would you offer to young uh, Special Operations Force members or intelligence professionals on how to work in this contemporary threat environment? I would say to a read some read your history read the histories of these of these intelligence operations as i mentioned earlier in this program i took a lesson from an old bolshevik from felix zerzhinsky who founded the Cheka, which became the kgb which today is fsb and svr uh, you know and and don't demonize your opponents if you if you go around using derogatory terms about people and things like that and you demonize them you can't recruit them You've got to respect what they're doing, respect in the sense these are intelligence professionals and we need to appreciate that these people are smart. They're very smart. I think we're smarter. I think we're more flexible than they are and they are recruitable. So just just remember that to uh, I, I used to like to say that I, 19 mornings out of 20 in my career, I couldn't wait to get to work. I loved what I did. I just. When I was recruited into the CIA, the gentleman that was my last interviewer, he was about a GS-13 at the time, so very mid-level. He took me to the cafeteria at CIA, and he bought me a Coke. And then he looked at me, and he said, Jim, let me tell you how much fun this job is. Every two weeks, I'm always shocked that they pay me for this. And I thought, oh, Lord, I want a job like that. And I found it. I found this was my job. That I, it was addictive, it was, you know, the, being an intelligence officer, helping to protect our national security. It was literally, it was being part of that inner circle and, and working things to make our country safe. To me, that was a very, and still is, a very addictive thing. Uh, my books are all about national security. And one theme that Mike mentioned earlier was the sacred commitment we make to the people whom we recruit. In both of my first two books, that theme runs through there. It is a sacred commitment that we make to the people that we recruit, our foreign assets. And I was very distressed at uh, what was going on in Afghanistan, although I know a lot of people made very courageous efforts to get those people out. And I have little patience with our Congress or whomever who we need to facilitate getting those, those Afghan uh, friends of ours, our allies, our assets. We need to get them here in the United States. They put their lives on the line and they're still putting their lives on the line for us. And we've got to never forget that because it's it was a commitment that we make that we can't just forget and dispose of these people. They are not assets on paper. They're f human flesh and blood, brothers and sisters who gave and, you know, giving them their lives for us. And we need to really honor that commitment. I, uh, I mean, it was a theme in my life that if I gave my word, I would come after you. I would go to hell and back to get you out of trouble. And so we've got to never forget that. But I would say that uh, having an open mind, being curious, um, you know, feeling uh, that, you know, getting really into something. You don't have to be a scientist to recruit a scientist. Uh, in fact, we we tried that at CIA for a while of hiring scientists to become case officers. 
And they might have been pretty good scientists, but frequently they were not that great as case officers. And I maybe it's a it could be that, you know, they don't typically possess the interpersonal skills that a case officer needs to be able to recruit someone. There are exceptions. I got I I know some one good friend of mine, PhD from my alma mater from Rice University. He has a PhD in physics and he was a fabulous recruiter. But you know, you for somebody like me who was a political science major, you don't need to have that. We've got subject matter experts who can train you enough to give you the scientific American or popular science version of the science. And then when you really need a SME, a subject matter expert, we've got a lot of those. And I know your organization does too, or you can find them. Uh, but it's the person on the front line, the case officer who's doing the recruiting and asking the questions, being curious. Uh, and I, I'm just fascinated with people. Sometimes I like to say if I had not been a case officer, I would have loved to have been either a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And a lot of my assets basically are responding to me as if I'm their therapist. Because I find that interesting. I, and I do this even now. I'm not interested in recruiting somebody, but I'm just really curious about what makes somebody tick. And I'll ask questions. And by the way, that's one way you, you your cover is very good. It's protected that way because... I never had anybody question me about my cover. It's because I would get them talking about themselves. I was much more interested in about them than they would be about me. And people love to talk about themselves. They, they just find that so fascinating, so gratifying that someone's genuinely interested in them. And, and I was, I was genuinely interested in these people and they can feel it. Jim, on behalf of the Joint Special Operations University, Thank you uh, for your service to this nation and continued contributions to our national security. Uh, I want to make a plug for Jim's upcoming book. Uh, be on the lookout for his third book in this series called The Trader's Tale. And then I'll turn it over to you, Jim, for any parting comments. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, this third book is about treachery within the CIA itself. Um, it's about a case officer who is a uh, absolute top flight case officer who is wrongly accused of being a mole. And he is very upset. He loses almost all of his friends. They shun him. They treat him like a leper. And he's innocent. He knows he's innocent. And then ultimately he's exonerated, but he is massively pissed off. And he thinks, well, screw them. They thought I was going to do it or that I had done it. Now I'm going to really do it. And so he volunteers to the Russians, and then he begins a life of basically a double life. So uh, it's a tale about loyalty and treachery, and uh, I'm hoping to get this out by spring of this coming year. But other than that, I've enjoyed this very much, Mike. I, I wish you and all of your special operations colleagues the best of not just luck, but the best work possible. This is a very, very rewarding profession, and I, I wish you well on that. Thank you again.